My name is uh, Dan McKenna, I'm your interim superintendent of schools, and I will be introducing tonight's program, uh, STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Mathematics. Um, I think what you'll um, see tonight is what's different about school today, about what we're trying to do in school that goes far beyond just acquiring knowledge. It's how to use it. It's how to use these disciplines to solve problems, to design solutions. For me, this is quite fascinating because in my early career, I'm older than a lot of you folks. This is how I learned to teach. And then it went away in too many places, and that was unfortunate. Uh, and what you do today in problem-based learning and project-based learning is you value really all of what children can bring to the room. There are a lot of different abilities, and too often we isolated those abilities in the interest of developing a discipline. And yet we know that in order to really understand something, multiple perspectives are invaluable. And that's what this is about. The fascinating part to me about this is it used to be STEM, and then it became STEAM. And I think the addition of that A has helped critically in the success of this endeavor because our teachers think our teachers work in multiple dimensions. Next year, as we go into these new spaces in our uh, elementary schools, we thought about all that and we've added additional art to the elementary schools. Art uh, so each teacher will have each elementary school will have their own art teacher, and that additional time in the building is devoted to working with classroom teachers along with these other staff developers that we have to help in this whole process. This has sometimes been called constructivist learning, building ideas, valuing kids' ideas. I would take you so far back as to the Dewey School in America where the roots of much of this began. And there was this very famous book called Interest and Effort. And if you can capture students' interest you get a tremendous effort from them. Because they own it, it's theirs. And in the design process, we're looking to engage kids in a manner that they own it, and they use the talents and abilities that they have, along with the other children that they're working with. And that's the power of STEAM. Um, it's really in designing together, and learning how to work together. I used to say to people, I don't go into work and have a multiple choice test. Not too many of us do. Problems are unstructured. And the different perspectives that are brought to solving problems are invaluable. And that's, it, helped, it has helped me in my career as a, as a superintendent and as an educator. And we hope that that, and we believe, it will help your children to become better at whatever they choose to do. Uh, so, I want to introduce uh, Josh. Josh has been instrumental in this work, has been as Dr. Byrne in the background, and he'll take you through tonight's activities. And I've been doing this stuff for a 45 years, and it's really nice to see the focus. It's really wonderful to see this focus here in Chapel Hill. Your academic indicators are extraordinary but this takes you to far greater depth in instruction. It really makes for an environment where students take ownership of their learning. And if there's anything that we can teach your kids, it's that they own what they do, they love learning, and they work hard at it. So, I'm going to turn it over to Josh. Enjoy the evening. Josh. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I just want to introduce Zach and Ellen over here, we um, have super the STEAM team. And what is exciting about our work together is that Zach has an art background, Ellen has an elementary background, and I have a uh, math and programming background. So when the three of us get together, it's usually a lot of long debates and a lot of, Zach, I, I'm not, I don't see that perspective yet because I don't understand it. And a lot of us, and we have formed this sort of collective understanding of what STEAM is. And while we have an acronym, we don't like calling it by its specific disciplines because 
the types of work that Zach and Ellen do is the same that Paul, a science teacher, or myself would do. We just have different perspectives. And sometimes, when Zach was teaching, he might be doing the same project in an art class that I would be doing in a robotics class, in a design project. Um, and it took us 15 years to realize that and to come together and start to build a comprehensive STEAM curriculum in Chappaqua. Tonight, the purpose is we're going to learn about STEAM education. Um, we're gonna, we have professionals that work in STEAM industry at each table. They're going to do a, a little discussion with you uh, about what, how their work relates to STEAM education. And you're going to participate in a STEAM challenge, because what fun would it be to come tonight if you weren't going to be able to do something? Uh, and really, a Knowledge Cafe is not just about us to give information. It's about you to also give us feedback on the work that we're doing in Chappaqua. So we, you have note takers at each table that are going to dictate the conversations that you have. We're going to take those conversations and synthesize them. And as we make changes and go through iterations, we're going to use this feedback in order to build our skills and our content. The Tonight's schedule is built into three rounds. The first round is we're going to give a presentation, and then you're going to have a discussion. The second round is the professionals are going to speak, and you're going to have a discussion around that. And the third round is the precision and accuracy of paper airplane challenge. So all the materials that are on your table are for you to build paper airplanes with. So a couple of years ago, um, we were debating how many years ago. I think it was five years ago, Eric, that um, the Chacoa School community, teachers, administrators, Board of Education, decided to come up with our teaching and learning vision and goals. Now, if you've been to a board meeting any time between now and then, um, you've probably seen these vision and goals or have heard about them. Um, the vision and goal pushes us as educators to really focus on what's listed there, active student learning, where students are engaged in their experiences, strong student collaboration to reach the goals of making good decisions for students to, be, uh, to persevere, be resilient, apply problem solving strategies, think divergently, show empathy. Now, this is a shift. This is a shift from our you know, traditional classroom teaching that we all experienced going to school, where it was about memorizing facts and recalling dates. Um, it's, we want here in Chappaqua our students to be divergent thinkers, to solve problems. It's not about the dates of the battle in the Revolutionary War, it's about them answering the questions of why and how and figuring things out. So our vision and goals really started, this vision and goals document really started pushing us as educators to think about how do we do this in that, our classroom? What does that look like? At the same time, um, there's a whole bunch of research going on. And Georgetown University conducted a study on job growth, their study said that 5 million jobs by the year 2020 will go unfulfilled, unfilled because of skills gaps, particularly in the growing field of healthcare and STEAM. So while our district was reshaping and rethinking what teaching and learning looks like here in Chappaqua, you have all these researchers saying this is where the gap is. Our teachers, luckily, who have already started thinking about this, um, decided to come together. And this past summer, and it, and it started a couple years ago, but really started gaining momentum um, last school year, to the point that teachers wanted to come together and design this program. And this past summer, about 40 plus teachers came together for a week long, they took a week out of their summer vacation to start thinking about what STEAM looks like here in Chappaqua. What does that mean for our teaching and learning? What does that mean for our schools? What does that mean for our students? 
And those 40 teachers debated and argued and, and wordsmiths to come up with this mission statement of what STEAM in Chappaqua is. And I'm just going to read it aloud to you for those who can't see it in the back, but they decided that the Chappaqua Central School District has developed a framework for creative problem solving and authentic project-based learning, which integrates science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Our mission is to provide a cohesive K-12 experience. Students actively and collaboratively engage in a cyclical design process that includes brainstorming, production, and reflection. The STEAM curriculum will foster lifelong skills and dispositions, enabling students to apply knowledge in an ever-changing world. To think about that that's our mission as a community of educators from kindergarten through 12th grade with those that are in the circle around it, those being the dispositions that we want our students to foster and to grow and to develop over time. This is the draft of the mission statement. We're still working on this, and who knows, in two years from now it might change, but right now, this is what we're going on. This is our mission for the STEAM work. And so we spent last summer and a lot of this school year really thinking about the why. Simon Sinek says that if you don't start with the why and have a good foundation of why you're doing this work, the how and the what falls apart. And so we've spent this whole year going school building to school building, meeting to meeting, week to week. Josh Zach and I have fought it out day in and day out. So what, what's the purpose of this work? And we're finally starting to, with our teachers, get to the how and the what. But um, there's an author, uh, John Spencer and A.J. Giuliani, who wrote a book called Launch that a bunch of us are reading right now. They also have a blog, so feel free to um, read that. I get it weekly. Um, it just pops into my email. And so John Spencer really started to think about what does he, what is innovation mean? What are innovators? And this just kind of synthesizes for us a little bit of the why of our work. I used to hate the word innovative. See those quotation marks right there around the word? Those are actually air quotes that I would use to mock it. It's a buzzword, I would say. It's overused, I would point out, and it's true. The word innovation has a certain overly glossy high-tech connotation to it. It makes me think of the Epcot Center or the Astrodome or the Floby, that true innovation in haircutting that combined a hair trimmer and a vacuum cleaner. Or it makes me think of Apple's decision to switch to wireless headphones when nobody was asking for it. But that's not innovation. That's novelty. That's disruption. That's change for the sake of change. But Innovation is different. Innovation is what Lynn manuel Miranda did with Hamilton and how he changed the musical genre. Innovation is Camden Yards and AT&T Ballpark boldly changing stadiums by looking backward in order to move forward. Innovation is that cancer treatment that didn't exist five years ago and now has the chance to save the life of someone you love. It's driven by a sense of purpose. It's what happens when you say, there's got to be a better way. And then you experiment and take creative risks to see what happens. I know the term might be trendy and maybe even overused, but I want to see students become innovators. I want to see them engage in divergent thinking as they find new routes to solve complex problems. I want to see them take creative risks and challenge the status quo. I want to see them dream up new possibilities and work through tons of iterations to reach success. I want them to be boldly and unabashedly different. In other words, I want to see them change the world. And that's what it means to be innovative. So tonight is really about those skills and those strategies that we, that John Spencer spoke about in that video. 
Tonight is about rooting us as a community in the Y. Next year, our hope is to have more nights like this, but with students, to talk you through the process of the how and the what. So this is for us as a community, a Chapel Park community of teachers, administrators, parents, um, to understand the why, uh, to help direct our work. Our group of 40-something teachers that met over the summer was, were so passionate about the work that they were doing that they wanted to continue studying this and forming this program through the school year. And actually, now we have more teachers that have come aboard um, in this project. And one of the big things that we did is we created uh, what we're calling our Reason to Be document. Um, these are three of the categories of our reason to be. This is the, the principles that guide um, what we believe learning experiences should be. This document is in your packet that you picked, if you picked up at the uh, front table. The principles, what we want, uh, we believe curriculum that fosters the development of, the outcomes, and then how, are we, um, how do we assess that? This is what is grounding our work, our mission statement. The, this reason to be, um, and this is the backbone of everything that we're doing right now in our STEAM program. So where are we doing this? In the elementary schools, our libraries are merging with maker spaces and becoming global learning centers. They're being redesigned, redesigned thanks to our bond. Um, to really be the hub of innovation of our elementary schools. The middle schools will be getting STEAM centers, um, as well as the high school and some construction in some of the, um, in our L building. So, modeled after the MIT Media Lab on the left, this is a mock 3D drawing of a section of our high school STEAM center. <coughs> So this is the work that our group of educators, our STEAM um, leaders, have uh, developed already. We've thought out and negotiated a design process that we've all agreed on, and if you take a scan around the room, we've sectioned it off. Uh, we have a K-1 design process. What design process looks like in grade two, what it looks like at grade three and four, design process fifth grade through eighth grade, and design process for our high school students. So it's increasing um, the language, but keeping consistent the process. We've also created a skills list, with, which incorporates dispositional um, and thinking skills, process skills, application skills. We've mapped out content knowledge, or we're still in the process of mapping out content knowledge. That's an ongoing process. Uh, that students will learn K-12 in, in uh, their STEAM um, experiences. And we've also developed project templates and planners and tuning tools and guides for teachers. So it's been a very busy year. Um, these teachers have worked really hard. Um, some of them are amongst you right now. Uh, and so this is the work. This is all rooting in the why, but getting to the how and the what. Thank you. So this is one of my favorite things that the uh, team put together so far. This is the design process, and what you're looking at on the board is the 9 to 12 version. As Ellen said, around the room you can go and look at the, um, the other versions of it. And the reason that I really love this is that this is a tool for empowering students. This is a framework for looking at problem solving and understanding how to attack a problem. Problems are hard to solve. If you just say, here's a problem, go to it, see if you can figure that out. That's a really difficult task to get to a student. Without giving them a framework to think about problems, how to develop divergent thought, how to come to solutions, and we're just talking about one individual person solving a problem. As soon as you have multiple people in a team trying to solve a problem together, having a framework like this to understand what the process is going to be is key to those people really being able to work together and to use their own individual strengths to, um, to approach the problem at hand. 
So uh, this design process was uh, developed in-house. We used a lot of research from the Buck Institute. You might notice that it kind of mirrors the scientific process or the writing process, which was done on purpose so that students can see um, how a prototype is in many ways very similar to a draft of an essay, or your hypothesis in science might be very similar to your prototype. So, um, so you might see some of those uh, connections. A couple of the things I want to point out, I was told that last time, I love this slide so much, I could really stay here all night and talk about it, but I was told to keep it a little bit shorter. So um, a couple of things I want to point out is that um, one of the strengths of a process that's really well spelled, spelled out for students is one, when they understand it, then they internalize it. If they've seen it a lot of times, they've gone through it a lot of times, from kindergarten through 12th grade, they internalize it and it becomes second nature for how to approach a problem. And this is a loose framework. You don't always have to attack a problem the same way. You can come into it from different points. But now students can say, should we really come, maybe we could start off with prototyping and then work our way backward to research this time. But at least it gives them the language to talk about those things. It lets them understand the phases that they're in when they're doing certain things. So um, we have three phases, pre-production, production, and post-production. Obviously, that's not the terms you use for a kindergarten student. So there's a totally pictorial version. There's language that talks about think, make, reflect which is the same as pre-production, production, and post-production, but the phases stay the same, K to 12. It's color-coded, the same, K to 12. The steps, goal-setting, exploring, decision-making, they might be called slightly different things at each grade level, but they're the same pieces of the puzzle that students are looking at. So, although students might not use some words like, who might, but they might not use prototyping or logistics, production logistics, in elementary school, they can understand a works-like model and a looks-like model. That the goal of one model is to do something and the other one is, this is what it's going to look like, but the goal of this model isn't to do add the actual function of it. So, um, one of the things that's kind of, kind of hidden is the feedback. Just notice that there's feedback in between every step. There's a lot of opportunities in there for that. And the important thing is that there's iteration. When you get to prototyping, you might find that your prototype fails. You might find that tonight. When you throw your airplane for the first time, it doesn't go exactly where you want it to go. And all of these phases are cyclical, so you can then say, well, our prototype didn't work. Maybe we have to go back and reset our goals. Maybe we have to go back and do a little more research. But you can always go back, and the goal of this is that when you're done, it's just the first phase of the next attempt at trying to solve this problem, which is why Apple has version one through nine of their phone. They're still iterating the phone. So um, we wanted to show you some examples of student work. Chris Sassi, a uh, technology teacher at the uh, Seven Bridges, and Carolyn Elwood, um, who's an art teacher at Seven Bridges, have been working on having students design tiny houses. They have a technology and an art class working together, so it's 50 kids all doing this. and. This is some of the steps that the students have been through. Generating ideas, jotting ideas down, trying to think divergently, come up with as many different types of solutions as you can. A lot of different um, techniques for doing that. Then they had client interviews. We actually went in as clients for the students and told them about the tiny house that we wanted them to build for us. We have competing firms of students who are designing based on the same client. So they started to write down things like, um, should we have stairs or ladders? Would you prefer a Tudor exterior or are you more modern? What, and they would take down notes from the students and kind of, uh, from the teachers and kind of change their designs. And then they got to the point where they took those ideas and put them down on paper, really solidified that brainstorming into something concrete. And these are scale models of the tiny houses and with these grids, they can kind of plot in, well, how big is a refrigerator? Can I put that next to this, uh, this uh, island or not? And they kind of just placing things and changing and talking with the other members of the group to plan out. And then once they, they kind of had the general idea, they went into 3D renderings on the computer using um, SketchUp. 
and uh, some of them are also using CAD for blueprinting. And these are just a couple of the renditions partway through. Clients came back in, looked at the 3D versions of the houses, gave some more suggestions to the students. They talked about things. And then students are building scale models at this point. These are in progress, where they took those blueprints as the floor of the building. And they're starting to build the structures, and then, um, and then the furniture. And then this project, over time, can change. And some of the goals of this project might be maybe you do actually build one to full scale. Maybe you do a half scale model, and the whole class um, chooses one of these to bring to full production. But it's just really nice to see that this process end up in this product and to hear the students talk about their designs, what they would do differently next time, how the form and function are working. Because um, it really, the transformation from the beginning of our conversations with the students to actually building and applying what they learned, you wouldn't believe what they thought would fit in 120 square feet when we first had our conversations. Oh, you could have a living room, a kitchen, you just want to loft in there, sure. And, but their they're understanding now and their conversation is so deep now. And it's just really nice to see. Oh, and then here's another one. This one actually has a helicopter that lands on the top of the house. And Josh, do you want to talk about the framework? So you heard a lot about our processes, and we really feel that focusing on process and focusing on skills is important because the technology is going to change over time. So if we create a design process and we get, they create some new piece of equipment, um, I think Ellen today was talking to me about 3D printing to model human body and then to test certain devices on human bodies and someone that we're going to call to talk about. It was something we hadn't heard about before that we'd love to see, well, what could kids learn from that process? Um, so things are going to change. So our roadmap for right now, um, this year, you heard about a pilot project in, that's happening in our current courses right now. Um, we have our STEAM camp this summer, shameless plug, there are applications in the back. Um, it's a week in the end of August um, for grades 6 through 12, and we have a big writing camp for the younger grades at that same time. Um, our collaborative is going to come back together. We're going to start working on the why and the how, uh, the what and the how this summer, and start building units, putting them in our templates, piloting them next year, considering what courses we could teach, what can happen in what grade levels, what does a skills continuum K-12 look like, and what are students learning in that grade level. Uh, next year, continuing that skill, developing assessments. How do we know if what we think we're doing, we're actually doing, or what students are doing and they're learning? Um, continuing to pilot the projects, courses, assessment, and developing curriculum. Um, in 2018-19, so now we're sort of speculating and we're going to revise what we're doing, but we think that we're going to start building interdisciplinary projects and content, um, maybe create interdisciplinary courses and projects at the middle school, um, and create new high school courses in the following year. And then in 1920, we're thinking about how do we join courses together in a small period of time where students will learn multiple courses at the same time all at an institute. So these are our brainstorms. Obviously, the further out we go, the more it might change, the more that we learn. But we're trying to create a comprehensive plan in kindergarten through 12th grade that's progressive and students learn and develop the STEAM skills. So round one is you're ready to discuss. You've heard a lot from us now. And it's time for you to start discussing about what you think of what we just said. Um, what are your thoughts about it? In your packet, you have the design process. You have the philosophy, or our principles, outcomes, and assessment in there. And you also have our mission statement. We want you to spend five minutes thinking about what we said, reading those documents, and jotting notes in answering the questions that are on page five of your packet, which are, what do you notice? What are you thinking about right now? And why is this critical for the future success of our students? 
Um, after you write that down, call the time for the four minutes. You'll have a 10 minute discussion where your facilitator, table facilitator, will script what you're saying in your discussion. Now we're going to time for 10 minutes to have an open discussion about what are you noticing, what are you thinking about now, and why is this work critical to our students' success? And the um, facilitators are going to script and can also be part of the conversation as well. But we are going to have more opportunities to have to what you're doing. Um, throughout here. That other and part of it. These notes that we're going to get are really invaluable. We're going to move on to round two. We are going, we're, the way we're distributed, we're going to have everybody stay in the seats that they're in, and we're a little behind, so the change of seats would add to that time. So, the one thing I want to, um, so in our next round, at each table, there is an industry professional um, that can you see. Can you If you could raise your hand, just for us to make sure that there is one at each, at least one at each table, um, from here. In your pockets, look over to the round two industry professionals. Um, we previously asked. Um, a group of industry professionals answer the following questions. Uh, how has your education influenced your career? How do you think students should learn in school to be prepared for a STEAM career? Where do you think Chappaqua's mission statement, philosophy statement, and design process interact with your industry? And what STEAM skill set do you think students graduating Horace Greeley High School should have? And we said Horace Greeley High School, meaning when students go through our entire K-12 in Chappaqua, at the end of 12th grade of Horace Greeley, what skills should they have? They're going to present for 10 minutes, and then you're going to have a 15-minute conversation about what you just heard. The table facilitators are going to be the primary people that are going to manage. The, we're just going to manage time, and they're going to manage the process. Um, so, and we will float around to answer any questions that you might have at your tables. So, we're going to start the 10 minutes now. And the industry professionals. It's just a discussion, um, very informal, about and answering these questions. In information systems and uh, undergrad in uh, computer science, so key degree influence what I'm doing right now. Uh, my education influence what I'm doing right now. Uh, so right after, uh, right after college, I start the job. And, uh, Nobody wanted to ever sit next to me except for this guy who basically taught me like how to study and really pay attention and actually care about these things. Yeah, very strange experience. And I wound up going from like a C's and B's type guy to like a straight A honor student, um, you know, for the rest of my college career. Um, and it was, you know, that was actually the most important part of my education, that, that ending. And part of it, and a lot of this is great steam, I love all of it, but part of it is actually just working hard and like putting in the time and um, studying and getting good friends who actually care about what you're doing. And that was what basically switched me, like I said, from C's to like some honor stuff. Um, so that's, I guess, how education influenced me. And, you know, I, I think those are the things that we really need to teach the kids, right? Work very hard because it's not easy. Critical thinking skills is something that you have to start at elementary school, not just asking the question why, why are you doing it in a certain way, or how are you doing it. Um, I think it's very, very important. Um, and um, problem solving. If one thing doesn't work, if one experiment doesn't work, why doesn't it work? Why can't? Why don't you go around? How will I solve the problem? How do I get to it? I mean, um, these are things that's just not. You know the content. Based on the content, can you come up with? you know, all the other things that you were supposed to do. I mean, what would you do differently? Um, that is something that I feel we should have. Um, we are working with the students at the high school, really, to teach them and the same skills and basically to look at the impact of the grants that we're giving in school. So they interview them, they read the grants, they read the goal of the grant, they choose it based on their personal interest, and then the goal is if we're making a difference for them. And then they present that to the administration and to our board. So it's, it's really trying the management consulting skill set for the students. 
so we love it. They do an amazing job. They're very self-motivated. They have jobs. We actually have specific roles. And they We're going to move to the sort of the feedback portion of this. Um, and we want for the next 15 minutes have a discussion about what you just heard. What did you just hear from these professionals? What do you notice about it? What are you wondering about it? What are you wondering about how it relates to the skills that we should be teaching in our schools? Um, and this is really for us to get feedback and hearing, okay, so professionals have spoken. These are people that work at a very high level in fields that are crucially important to our world. What should we be teaching our students and what should we be learning in order to further our STEAM curriculum in Chapter 5. And that's the feedback that we're looking for now for the next 15 minutes. I went to Northeastern and all in Boston, and the professors all had to have a minimum of seven years, or maybe in the journalism school, seven years experience in the real world to teach there. Right. And almost, I mean, if you actually think about that model, it's an interesting model too, because everything's kind of speeding up into the high school level now, but if you think about more, what Northeastern does, it's a co-op, they face New York school curriculum is actually going and getting internships. So your actual learning is actually being on the job of learning it. So when we interview students at our, at our job, or our office, and they come from Northeastern, they have five or six internships. And yeah, they're internships. Still junior, they're still junior. I didn't even think about that, but I always like right. internships. Right. But that, there was nothing better than that. Right. So looking at what yeah. you're just saying now, I always think about uh, I'm uh, I got my students to well. learning and they're making inventions. So if students are, some students are trying to figure out exactly what makes the solar panel and a wind turbine, and some kids are, you know, designing an app, or some kids are doing something a little bit lower tech. And so there's that room for growth. The kids finish early, like they're writing a letter to NASA. So like there's, there are those opportunities for them to to have that that projection of where they can go. But you know, I have that flexibility where I have the whole day with them. So I think that that's something that we'll all have to think of is how do we get from that room yeah. to take off one more day? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's one thing to focus on knowledge. I think the other thing is that helps you all the more how to live in your career or life is a skill. I tell people, one day I can be a cognitive scientist, maybe another PhD, I can get, you know, if not as good as you are, but partially there with genetics. You can pick up that, but what, what gives you that foundation is that skill to question and the continuous learning, the passion to learn and the curiosity. That should not be either, right? Hearing is everything the students are doing. So that's my worry. There is no playtime in the sense of not playing outside research, the research for the brain, where children are getting together, they are inventing, where there is a you know open-ended problem that is given and not overly prescriptive. There's only one teacher, my son has been now in the school system for six years, now he's in the school. Only one teacher did that. He did give them a scope, you know, and then it helps them to define the project, build the team, staying through the course, solving it, and so on. It should be part of every year, every, right, every, uh, every class, and it should be not one-off, but that should be the norm. So, it's important to say, again, I'm going to kind of conversation short, and I promise you, this will be for a, a good and enjoyable reason, and you're going to enjoy our next um, so, because what would be what would be a steam evening without doing something that is an exciting process um, and going through it and, and doing something? And we chose our next activity to, to show you that yes, there are many activities that you're going to want to use some computer aided design for. You're going to want to use a CNC router or a laser cutter or um, some great equipment, but there's also some things that all we need is a piece of paper for. Um, and so we are going to build um, paper airplanes. So you're going to design a paper airplane that can fly 15 feet and land on a one-foot target. What we found when researching this is that there is a there are paper airplane competitions. Um, so we're going to show you a quick video.
25 minute video. <laughs> We watched the whole thing and chose the, the, the best clip. The level of, and I, I mean, I feel like art, like, the acrobatics. They had static, static electricity built up on balloons and were going to do flips. And we also realized by watching this that our doctoral thesis is going to be on gender studies and paper airplane making because there were no women making paper airplanes and we didn't understand why. Um, so we want to study it. So I'm going to turn it over to Zach about the, the challenge. Okay, so um, actually it's, if you're measuring, we actually went with 20 feet, so it's a little bit farther. And we want you to try to land um, on a one foot circle. And this is the PNA, the precision and accuracy. So you're going to get points you're going to have two throws for your team. And you're going to get points for being both accurate and precise. And just to bring you back to your high school physics classes, um, if you're both accurate and precise, you're going to be hitting the target dead center in the bullseye every time. And that's great, because you get a lot of points for that, both the repetition of hitting the high value target. Um, but you can also be accurate, but not very precise. So you're hitting the target a lot, but not right in the middle. So that's good because you're hitting the target, but you're not accumulating a lot of points because you're not repeating it. Um, you can be very precise and never hit the target because you're not accurate. And that's that little clump in number C that's off the target. That wouldn't garner you any points. And you could do um, neither accuracy nor precision, which my airplane was doing today. But, um, and that would be the scattered plots to the side. So as you're, um, as you're having fun today doing this, um, we're also going to be marking them on the floor, too. And you can just keep in the back of your head that there's, there's a science and math lesson behind this also. And you can do a lot of studies on the data of the numbers that we have on the floor and how close we were and how accurate and precise. You can actually do a lot of measurements. But this part's the fun part. So you're going to do the... Um, pre-production at your table. Um, you're going to explore as individuals, so we want you to either sketch out or you can build a paper airplane that you think would be perfect for your team. We're going to give you five minutes to do that and then collaborate and discuss what everybody has done at their table and what would be the pros and cons of each of the different types of uh, planes. And then make a decision as a group and incorporate your ideas together and make the best airplane for your table. And then we'll give you three minutes for that. Then you're going to prototype. You can build it, go out, test it out, make any revisions you want to do, modify, iterate. And then um, we're going to actually have, we have an exit ticket that Josh will talk about. But we're going to actually go out there and talk a lot about how you don't, you don't just make something, but you present it. You uh, present it to an audience. You try it out, you show it, and that's this book. If you have the time to read Launch, that's what it's all about, that you actually do something with the things that you make. So we're gonna launch the airplanes, and we're gonna keep score, and we'll have it up on the board there. And um, Josh just wants you to remember the exit ticket. So we're gonna be launching, no pun intended, into this. Um, we have about a half an hour for this activity. Um, and it's planned, we knew this was going to happen. It's planned for 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so there is the last page of your participant packet is an exit ticket um, that we'd ask you to fill out before you leave for the evening. Um, which, and give that to one of us or your table facilitator um, at the end of the evening. And just before we begin, um, Ellen has hit the bullseye every time she's thrown it, so she's going to show us how it's done. There's a lot of pressure, though. <laughs> oh! oh. 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 Well, I get three points for that throw. I just want to, we gave no material constraints for you. On your ticket, just what you have. You have um, photocopy paper, you have cardstock paper, you have large form paper, uh, paper clips, tape, scissors. The first part, we're going to give you five minutes of exploration and brainstorming. Um, you can sketch, you can build a plane now, you can 
whatever you want to do to brainstorm or material store. If you want to play with the materials that are on your table, you have five minutes to do that starting now. <laughs> All right, so and I think we have. Do you have a heavy yeah, option? I have two. It's light paper, though. Okay. Well, they should be the same shape if you're uh, going to compare. Sure, that is true. That's right. That's a good point. That's great. See, you're the real life guy. You're a killer person. Yeah. Thank you for coming this evening. Got a lot out of it.